Hello, everyone, and welcome tonight to our hard questions session. We are going to be uh, going over a couple of questions that we've already had on the uh, bulletin board. If you have any questions during this session, obviously you can put those into the chat on the side. If you're listening to this after the fact, please feel free to post on the hard sessions, uh, hard question session bulletin board. Uh, but welcome to Covenant Bible Fellowship tonight. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer to get this thing kicked off right, uh, and we are actually going to be praying a specific prayer for discernment. So, Lord, thank you so much for giving us the promise in Scripture that you will uh, open the word up to us if we ask. And, uh, Lord, so we just ask right now uh, with humility, knowing that we can't figure all these things out ourselves, uh, for you to give us discernment in the area of uh, the word tonight as we look up uh, the truth and we attempt to uh, to discern what you have for us in the Bible here. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so um, we're going to take a look at the questions that have already been asked, but if you have any questions to ask, please post them over here on the side. Uh, on the chat, and I will definitely see what we can't do to tackle that. Uh, now, I have to apologize. The hard question sessions have been uh, traditionally in person with a group, so it, it's going to be interesting doing these online. Um, the, the whole purpose of this is to, to help people to, um, to work through how to think through Scripture, right? To get yourself into the mindset of a, uh, a workman, someone who does not uh, need to wait for a pastor to explain everything to them, but who rather uh, approaches the Bible from the perspective of a uh, an empowered uh, person, an empowered Holy Ghost filled discernment uh, empowered person uh, to read the scriptures for themselves and to determine uh, what is and what is not. So it, it is a little bit interesting to try and do these in this medium because it's a lot more of a lecture hall and a lot less of a discussion. Uh, so I want to encourage everyone to please type your comments in the side. I, I rely on those. Uh, but the, the question today uh, that we're actually taking is one from Elder Vanessa. It says, uh, our reading in Ezra last week, and I believe that that was uh, four weeks ago that we were reading uh, early in Ezra, but our reading in Ezra last week took us to chapter 9, where many families, especially of the priests and Levites, had intermingled with the surrounding folks, most of whom were not traditional Jews. Once they discovered and reread the Mosaic Law, many repented, and the priests and Levites who were teaching made it clear that this was sinful. Ezra told the families to break up. My question is, what about loving families? What about those who wanted to convert? or who had actually converted to the best of their ability and knowledge. And the kids, what about them? There is so much left out here, and it seems so stark. Is there any extra biblical information on those who wanted to stay? All right, so I can tackle the first one right off the bat, probably. Um, but just because there is doesn't mean I know it, so I apologize on that front. I do not have any extra biblical information on those who wanted to stay for you. Um, I can certainly try and find that before the next time that we have a hard question session, if that is uh, something that you guys would like. What I'd like to tackle on this is just looking at it from uh, scripture, right? So there's a lot that history can do to help us understand things in the, in the peripherals. Um, but I, I'm going to, I'm going to bring in rope in some of the stuff I've been learning in school um, going through constitutional law right now, and a lot of the constitutional law is about uh, statutory interpretation. Um, and, and you can only really use some historic aspects of statutory interpretation when you've exhausted all other avenues. Uh, it's, it's never a good idea to turn to legislative history, for instance, uh, to interpret a law when the law itself seems to be very plainly written. Um, we, we need to follow that plain meaning of the text. So um, with the Bible, we do the same. We're going to follow that plain meaning of the text and then go from there. If the text is not plain, then we can try to approach uh, it from the surrounding texts, from uh, other texts. We have to understand that God always uh, has something in the Bible because it uh, makes sense with everything else. It's it's a, a parallel construction, right? It's a, a single solid thought. Nothing will 
contradict against another part. So we have a couple different ways, a couple different tools that we can use to try to determine what scripture means. And I've talked about this all a lot before. Usually I talked about this from the perspective of logic, right? Looking at this from building a syllogism from a minor premise and a major premise and approaching it from are we doing deductive or inductive reasoning. And all of those things are useful tools. Uh, and all of that sounds like I'm a professor teaching at a bunch of you know, college students. So I, I want you to take that with a grain of salt. We're gonna step back and look at this from a very basic perspective, right? So if everything that I said before went over your head, don't sweat it. We're just gonna think about this from common sense, right? This is a, this is a pretty simple thing that we can look at. So let's start by actually reading Ezra 9. We're going to see what it says, right? Uh, now, I'm going to be reading Ezra 9 out of the Geneva Bible. It is my favorite. Uh, I'm sorry, I do have a favorite, you know, but that's okay. I'm not judging any other version except for the NIV. I do judge the, no, I'm just joking. Um, so we're going we're gonna to read Ezra. Um, it says, when, as these things were done, the rulers came to me saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites are not separated from the people of the lands as touching their abominations. To wit, of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. All right, so we have a list of people, a group of people uh, from the Canaanites to the Amorites that all of them have been known to do what? Commit abominations, right? And so the problem that the rulers are approaching Ezra about uh, is not necessarily that they're connected to these people groups. There's no racial motivation for this comment, right? Um, it is that they're touching these people groups, why? As touching their abominations. They're connected to them as touching their abominations, which means that, you know, they're, they're not keeping themselves separate. Uh, scripture says that uh, we are to keep ourselves separate, right? We're supposed to be um, a, a special people. We're supposed to be unique. We're supposed to be pure. Uh, and of course, this in the Old Testament was taken very physically, very, uh, very realistically. You had ceremonial washings to keep yourself pure. Uh, you had certain foods that you had to eat or not eat to keep yourself pure. And of course, a lot of the things that they're talking about, the abominations that they're talking about are violations of those laws. So when they say that they have the Levites, the priests and the people of Israel have not separated from the people of the lands as touching their abominations. You can read they're being corrupted, All right, They're being corrupted by the world. Um, and so that's the complaint that's brought forward here, even in verse one. So let's go on from there. It says for four, and this is their explanation for what they've said as to them being corrupted. They have taken their daughters to themselves and to their sons. And they have mixed the holy seed with the people of the lands, and the hands of the princes and rulers have been chief in this trespass. All right, so he starts by saying that there is, uh, or, or rather the, the, um, the rulers here, start by saying that there's a problem. The problem is what? It is that the people of Israel, including the priests and the Levites, are being corrupted. And then they explain how they're being corrupted, right? So the, the how is that they've taken daughters to themselves and their sons and mixed the holy seed. So the problem isn't that they've taken daughters to themselves and their sons. The problem is that they are connected to those abominations, right? But that's the how. The how is they've taken the daughters to themselves. In verse 3, it says, But when I heard this saying, I rent my clothes and my garment and plucked off the hair of mine head and my beard and sat down, astonished or astonished. Uh, and that is something that you see as a, a theme, right? Um, it's a uh, tradition, if you will. It's an expression of grief. It's an expression of extreme anguish um, that he rips his clothes and um, plucks off his hair. He's, he's in extreme anguish for this. And he goes to the Lord in prayer. Uh, and so he says, uh, he sat down a stony first, uh, and then the Geneva makes a note on that. It says, as one doubting whether God would continue his benefits towards us or else destroy this which he had begun. Uh, and, I, you know, to be honest, I feel that same way sometimes. I look around at the uh, United States of America, and I know that we have had the blessing of the Lord in the past, and to a degree we still do. Um, and then I see, you know, abortion and um, the other ridiculous sins that have reached such a high level of uh, a stench in God's nostrils that I am sometimes terrified. I am 
very much uh, worried, uh, I'm anxious, if you will, that uh, the Lord might take his blessing from us, uh, you know, and, and stop working on what he began here, because he did begin this place. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's aside. So verse four, it says, and there assembled unto me all that feared the words of the God of Israel because of the transgression of them of the captivity. And I sat down a stone eat until the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice, I rose up from mine heaviness. And when I had rent my clothes and my garment, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord, my God. And said, O oh my God, I am confounded and ashamed to lift up mine head unto thee, my God, for our iniquities have increased over our head, and our trespass is grown up unto the heaven. From the days of our fathers have we been in a great trespass unto this day, and for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hands of the kings of the land, unto the swords, into captivity, into spoil, into confusion of face, as appeareth in this day. And now for a little space grace hath been showed, from the Lord our God in causing a remnant to escape and in giving us a nail in his holy place that our God may light our eyes and give us a little reviving in our servitude. And then uh, by nail there, he's saying that he's given, um, he's given you something to hang on, right? Like a picture frame has a nail to hang on. He's giving you something that's, that's to keep you solid, an anchor. Um, and then it goes on in verse 9 to say, For though we were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath inclined mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia, to give us life, and to erect the house of our God, and to redress the desolate places thereof, and to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. And now, our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments, which thou hast commanded by thy servants the prophets, saying, The land whereunto ye go to possess it, it is an unclean land because of the filthiness of the people of the lands, which by their abominations and by their uncleanness have filled it from corner to corner. And that's key because the problem is not that there are people in the land that aren't Israelites, right? God's not racist. He doesn't care. He made them all to begin with. The problem is the fact that the people in the land have been corrupted by abominations and uncleanness, right? So then he goes on in verse 12. He says, now therefore shall ye not give your daughters unto their sons. Why are you not giving your daughters to their sons? Because they're unclean. Their sons are eaten up with abominations. They're, they're messed up in the head, right? So you're not going to give your daughters unto their sons. Neither shall you take their daughters unto your sons, nor seek their peace nor wealth forever, that you may be strong and eat the goodness of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your sons forever. In other words, don't mix cultures. Their culture is corrupt. And I don't want your culture to be corrupted by their culture. That's what he's saying. So again, no racist application here at all. God does not care whether they're Egyptian or not, right? They came out of Egypt as a mixed multitude to begin with. And of course, the law is already in place and has been in place for a long time for people to become Jews if they want to become Jews, even if they are uh, a part of one of those people groups. So if you had a parasite or a, a Moabitish woman, right, like uh, the ones that we found in the line of Christ, that we were talking about before, um, who wanted to become a Jew, sure, you know, come on, be a Jew. But in order to be a Jew, what do you have to do? You have to give up those abominations which made you unclean. So you had to give, get rid of the uncleanness in your life, and then you're not a, you know, a, a, a Moabitish unclean person anymore. You're a prospective Jew. You're, you're on your way into being a Jew. Um, so then it says, uh, after, uh, and we're going to come back down to verse 13. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great trespasses, seeing that thou, our God, hast stayed us from being beneath for our iniquities. And then what he, what he means by that is that you've not completely destroyed us, right? You, we're, not, uh, we're not under the dirt uh, yet. Seeing that thou, our God, hast stayed us from being beneath for our iniquities and hath given us such deliverance, should we return to break thy commandments and join in affinity with the people of such abominations? Wouldest not thou be angry towards us, or till thou hast consumed us, so that there should be no more remnant nor any escaping? O Lord God of Israel, thou art just, for we have been reserved to escape. As appeareth this day, behold, we are before thee in our trespass, therefore we cannot stand before thee because of it. Uh, and then in Ezra 10, which is where this whole thought ends, 
Uh, it says, when Ezra prayed thus and confessed himself with weeping and falling down before the house of God, there assembled unto him of Israel a very great congregation of men and women and children, for the people wept with a great lamentation. Uh, and then he says, then Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam, answered and said to Ezra, we have trespassed against our God and have taken strange wives of the people of the land. Yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this. Now, therefore, let us make a covenant with our God and put away all the wives and such as are born of them, according to the counsel of the Lord and of those that fear the commandments of our God and let it be done according to the law. Okay, so um, they're trying to get back to following the law. They're trying to get back to doing it correctly, right? And that's good. Um, but the question that had been raised earlier, just to bring it back up, and I'm going to read through that question one more time, and then I'm going to take a look and see if any of you have made any comments um, but it says, so if you're thinking about making a comment, now would be the time. It, the question was, our reading in Ezra took us to chapter 9, etc., etc. Once they discovered and reread the Mosaic Law, many repented. The priests and the Levites who were teaching made it clear that this was sinful. Ezra told the families to break up. My question is, what about loving families? What about those who wanted to convert? Or had actually converted to the best of their ability and knowledge? And the kids, what about them? There's so much left out here, and it seems so stark. Is there any extra biblical information? Okay, so um, let's tackle each one of these pieces by itself, uh, and I'm going to pick them out at uh, the little piece. And the kids, right? That's one of the questions, yes. And the kids. That's uh, very clearly said here in Ezra 10, uh, and that's Ezra 10 uh, verse 3 where it says to put away all the wives and such as are born of them. Um, so the kids were absolutely included in that. And then it says, um, uh, what about all those who wanted to convert or had actually converted to the best of their ability and knowledge? Now to that, I'm actually going to go back to Mosaic Law. Um, so if we take a look in the Mosaic Law about becoming a Jew, um, we can find that there was a, a, a way to become a Jew. And again, you had to get rid of, um, you, you had to get rid of your previous patterns of behavior. You had to become a Jew, not just uh, by declaration, but by, um, but, but by heart, right? You had to, to start serving God. So in order to, Mary, if you pardon my pun, um, the, the legal requirement of Deuteronomy 7.3, which says, Neither shalt thou make marriages with them, thy daughter shall not give unto his son, nor his daughter shall take unto thy son, which is, of course, the verse that, that Ezra is talking about, uh, with the fact that the Mosaic Law does allow for people to uh, become a Jew uh, over a long period of time. It takes generations to do so completely. Um, in order to marry those facts, you have to understand that when God is talking about being a Jew, and, and this is true for all of the Old Testament stuff, right? The goal had nothing to do with, you know, making sure all of the procedures were followed correctly. Uh, the goal had to do with, is your heart in the right place, right? So um, that's why he was able to account it for righteousness uh, to, uh, to Ruth, Right and to uh, the the lady who uh, saved the the spies. Right, so we have a couple examples of how you know the other side of this story goes, which is the the loving family who does believe that you know they're uh, they've already converted or on their way to converting. Um, so the answer to that would be they don't count. Right. If they're converting, then they are not part of the corrupted group that, you know, the Jews are not allowed to marry. Um, so that's that's the answer to that as best as I can say it. However, uh, what about loving families? Now, that's a good question. And the reason that's a good question is actually uh, I'm going to phrase this to you a different way. I want you to understand something, which is that God does not change. Right. God is the same yesterday, today and forever. Uh, and there are some restrictions which are still restrictions. Right. Like um, during the time of the Jews, there was a particular punishment for this restriction that is not now. But um, if a woman loved a woman, what about that? What if it's what if they really what if they really loved each other? What about loving families? 
well, you'd have to break up, right? I mean, it wouldn't just be a breakup, it'd be a stone up. It would be a little bit of a, of a, of a harsh reality there. Um, so under the time of the law, uh, if you were a lesbian or if you were gay, um, it was the death penalty. Now, we are under grace. It's not the death penalty anymore, but it is, in a way, still the death penalty because you're killing yourself. It's sin, right? So we have this, this time of grace now, but that's still not an okay behavior. According to the Bible, it's still prohibited. So the question, if we apply the question the same way that a lot of people do today in especially the political sphere, but in the religious sphere, is, you know, what about a, a really, truly loving gay couple who, um, you know, they have a great relationship with each other. They aren't abusive in any way. They support each other. Uh, they have a better relationship than most, uh, you know, uh, most heterosexual couples, and they end up converting. They both end up coming to God. What about that? What about that loving family who, who wanted to convert and convert it? What, what, what happens to them? And the answer is, even under grace, even under today, under grace, if they're truly converting, then what happens? God will convict them about their relationship, and they may be able to become friends afterwards, but they're not going to be a couple, right? Because they can't. They can't practice homosexuality and call themselves Christians. They can't. It's against the Bible. It's against what God wants. So to answer the question, what about loving families? I'm going to get a little bit harsh and a little bit, you know, uh, uh, a, a little bit of a, of a uh, prophet here. Um, so what? You know, you can really love someone who is dragging you straight down to hell, but that doesn't mean that you have to be drugged down to hell too. Right. If you're if you really, really love that person, then do your best to get them out of the darkness. Right. So there's there's a a, a way for that to happen. Uh, but that way does not include remaining married. And back in this Ezra uh, passage, it would have been the same if you had a Jew who had, you know, truly fell in love with a uh, an Egyptian woman and the Egyptian woman still worships her Egyptian gods, and the Egyptian woman refuses to get rid of her Egyptian gods, and the Jewish man says, well, that's okay, she can believe what she wants to believe, and I'll believe in the God of the, the Bible, and then all of a sudden, he's really convicted now, because the law has come out, and Ezra says, no, you got to get rid of your, your partner, and he goes, but I really love my wife. Well, I mean, I get it, you really love your wife, but she's unclean. Your relationship, therefore, is unclean. So if you really love her, try to keep that, that, uh, that partnership going, if you will. But you're going to kill yourself. You're going to be violating God's law. You're going to be bringing sin into your own life and making yourself unclean. No, that's not okay. So they had to break up, even if they loved each other. And that sounds really harsh. It really does. But it applies to today, too right? Even if they love each other, a homosexual couple or a lesbian, you know, a, a lesbian or gay couple, they cannot become Christians together and stay together as a married couple. They may really love each other, but it doesn't work, right? It doesn't work because it's against God's law. So um, there, there, are, there, there are ways to, 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 to see this kind of coming over to today. But to answer your question there, uh, and we're going to go through it and make sure that I've hit every point. Um, but Ezra told the families to break up. Question is about the loving families. Got that. What about those who wanted to convert? Got that. Or who had actually converted? The kids, what about them? Um, so is there any extra biblical information on those who wanted to say? Again, I don't have any extra biblical information on that. Uh, but the the best answer that I can give you on that is, you know, Google is your friend. Uh, so there may be. There may be some good information on that out there. I, I don't remember anything that Josephus had to mention about it. Um, but we can, I, I can certainly do that research if you'd like for me to. Um, does anybody have any questions on what I have so far? Let me go ahead and read and see if anybody put anything over there. Okay, yes. It was Ruth, uh, Ruth in the, the lineage of Christ and... Um, Let's see. If they followed the new information regarding the law, they might be okay. 
Uh, um, if they were willing to convert, then they that may have been something where they got an exception. I can't I can't speak to that. I wasn't there, obviously, um, and it wasn't something that I I read, but. Um, Right, exactly. Uh, for those who loved each other but followed different faith paths, either had to break up for the Jewish one to stay and the other to leave, or both go with the pagan way or both go the Jewish way. So um, just as an example, you know, we, we mentioned Ruth earlier. Uh, you, see, uh, you see how she did it, right? Um, when her husband married her, she became a Jew. She was still a Moabitess, right? Because it wasn't the third generation. But who did she worship? Who's, whose God was her God? Um, it was, she, she was a Jew. So, um, you know, that, that would have been, that would have been, I believe, the deciding factor here is that you had a group of people who were dedicated to uncleanness, all right? They ate meat offered to idols and did so on purpose in order to give worship to those idols. They may have gone even so far as burning children or, you know, any of the other horrible things that they did, having orgies and, you know, all the craziness that, that went along with the pagan religions of the day. Um, and those things all were abominations, right? So um, it was not so much the color of their skin or their national ancestry uh, or even the way that they sing songs that God had problems with. Um, the, the issue was the abominations that they were dedicated to, right? It was the idolatry. And when you bring idolatry into your home, you corrupt yourself. Uh, there's, a, there's a corruption that goes on. So God didn't want his people bringing idols into their homes. And even if that idol was the wife's idol, it's not okay. You know, you don't bring idols into your home. Any questions on that question? All right, so we're gonna, um, we're gonna move on to the second uh, issue which we have, uh, and that is laws, precepts, statutes, word, judgment, ordinances, ways, testimonies. In Psalm 119, they're used almost interchangeably, and this is Elder Phil, uh, the Geneva and the King James often differ in which one to use on any given verse. How interchangeable are they really? Okay, so um, when you're looking at Psalm 119, what you're looking at is a poem, right? The, uh, the person who's writing this is writing something for teaching. Uh, it's a teaching poem. It helps you to learn the alphabet, um, but it, and that's the Jewish alphabet, uh, but it is a poem nonetheless. So it is like any other poem written to sound good. Uh, and in the original language, I'm sure it sounds fantastic. Um, so when I write poems, because I like to write poems, um, I can tell you that my method of doing so often involves coming up with uh, a word that sounds good in the right place and has the meaning I want, right? So if I want a specific meaning, then I'm going to be going through words for a minute, trying to figure out which word fits it best. And a lot of times those words are all going to be, you know, found in my thesaurus. They're, they're not necessarily have exactly the same meaning if you saw them in a legal text, maybe. Um, they might have some slight differences. When we see it in Psalm 119, um, we can pretty well interpret it as being poetic, right? This is the poetic uh, phrase. So all of the all all of, of Psalm 119 is uh, line by line by line a poem, uh, and so there's a there, there's an artistic license, if you will, that's applied there. And yes, I would believe that all of them are going to be applied generally to the exact same thing, which is the law. Right, and we can interpret it as the law. Now, there are some exceptions, I'm sure, uh, but for the most part, you're going to be seeing that they all are talking about the law, uh, and that's why they're interchangeably used. Is because this is is art, um, and it's beautiful art, right? It's 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 art that uplifts. It's art that points us back to God and and the glories of of the Word. But it is it's still art. Um, which makes it a little bit more flexible, if that answers that question. Do we have any questions on that question? No. Okay. All right. So um, 
If we have any other questions, I can tackle those now. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. I look forward to having uh, some more questions from you guys next time. Uh, please feel free to put those into the hard questions section uh, of our website uh, or the hard questions bulletin board here on the on uh, the Facebook page, and I will be happy to do some research and tackle those next time. Also, uh, I have a question for you guys uh, that I'm going to mix it up a little bit, and I'm going to give you homework. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm going to ask for you guys to do a little bit of research on this question for me, uh, and then come back next week so that we can discuss this a little bit better. And I think this is going to be the way that I tackle uh, this little bit of a weird um, medium for doing a, a Bible study of this type. Um, so if you can go to James 4.17, uh, and then I'm going to read just James 4.17, and that may be a hint, but uh, you know if it is, that's good, so you can take that hint. Uh, but I'm going to read just James 4.17, and it says, Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Okay, so wonderful passage gives us a lot of application for most of our life. Uh, if we know to do something uh, good and we don't do it, it is a sin for us. Uh, so what could possibly be your question, Pastor Dosh? The question is, why did he use the word therefore? All right, that's your question for this this next upcoming hard question se session, I want you to, in detail, uh, figure out for me and explain to me why he says, therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. With that, we're going to go ahead and pray, uh, and we are going to, to close that out. Um, Lord, thank you so much for your insight, for your uh, discernment that you give us, for the Spirit, uh, Holy Spirit, thank you for opening our eyes and, and showing us the truth in your word. Please help us to always keep our minds stayed on you as we go about our daily activities and never be um, stuck in the, the humdrum of life uh, without uh, paying attention to uh, what you you have for us. And I know that you can always do that to even in the little things. So I just pray that you would, and that you would help us to keep our, our focus in the right place uh, and our joy full. In Jesus' name, amen. Go with God.